So, we're at Matthew chapter 9. Just going to look at three verses. Verses 35 to 38. That's four verses. Sorry. And uh, there's a lot in these verses. I was tempted to split this over two weeks. But I thought, no, let's try and get it all done today. The title that I've given today's sermon is What's Our Job Description? What's Our Job Description? Now, when we get jobs, obviously we find out what our job description is because we want to know what we're supposed to be doing (laughs) and also what we're not supposed to be doing. And what we're going to do today is look at a Bible text that I believe is a good job description of what the church should be doing so that we will know, okay, what should we be doing as a church and what shouldn't we be doing? And it's going to be helpful to people who are believers to know what the church is about and even for people who don't follow Jesus, they might be able to look at this to understand, okay, what is following Jesus all about? What is the church supposed to be doing? So, by the end of today, we all know what we're doing, hopefully. Let's kick it off. Verse 35. Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and sickness. The way I've worded it here, sorry, not the way I've worded it, the way I laid it out is basically showing you the way it is in the Greek with the participles. It's basically emphasizing three things. So it's like saying, Jesus went around and he did these three things, teaching, preaching, and healing. So the point I'm making here is that Jesus teaches, preaches, and he heals. And the church should be doing the same ministry that Jesus did back then. We should be doing that same ministry today. So you could say that we should teach preach and heal. And when I say we, I mean we as a church. This, this is the three things we should be involved in doing. If you check out Acts chapter 1, Luke's writing the book of Acts, right? And he's writing it to his friend, Theophilus. And he says in verse 1, I wrote the former account, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Now, do you notice the word began? He's saying these are the things Jesus began to do until he was taken up to heaven. So there's an implication here, which is that Jesus started doing a work, and when Jesus went up to heaven, the work carried on through the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to the church, and obviously then through the church. So the ministry that Jesus started, we as a church are supposed to continue. And this is such an important point to grasp because we often think of church as a Sunday service. And we often think that's what it's about. And actually, it's about following on Jesus' work. So when we use the word church, what would be really cool if from now on it always sprung to mind, when we say church, we're talking about continuing Jesus' work. Not thinking about the Sunday service, but thinking about continuing Jesus' work. And his work was clearly shown in these three things. What are they? There we go. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Nice one. So let's look at each of those three. The first one, teaching. Jesus taught people so that they knew how to live in his kingdom, how they should be acting. So teaching is necessary for us and for others to know how to behave in Jesus' kingdom. And this is important because without the teaching, we're just guessing, spitting in the wind, not really going anywhere. And I know that myself, for a long time, was guilty of having loads of opinions about church that weren't based on Scripture. They were just based on my own reasoning. And I would say to people, well, church should be this, and churches should do that, and blah, blah, blah. But it was just Duncan's own opinions. I don't think God cares too much about all those opinions. He's already given us a Bible (laughs) with his opinions in it. So these days, what we're trying to do is find out what does the Bible say. We look at the teaching, and then we know how we should behave in the kingdom. So here's some applications for teaching. Reading the Bible. That's really important for us to all be reading the Bible. And that's part of what our Thursday nights is about, isn't it? That we're all reading through the Bible together. We're reading the book of 
uh, Deuteronomy at the moment, reading it, trying to read it the way that the original recipients of those books read them and getting blessed by doing it. But another application is personal Bible study so that us as individuals hopefully are sitting there with our Bibles open in our living room, just on our own, with a notepad, making notes, studying it. Not just reading it like a book, but in-depth study of the words, getting out Bible dictionaries, looking to see what it means, phoning a friend and saying, what do you think of this verse? That kind of thing. That's really important. And obviously, group Bible studies are really important as well. And one of the reasons that a group Bible study is that we learn. Uh, the other thing is that often there will be one particular leader of the group Bible study who hopefully has the gift of teaching, which is a gift talked about in the New Testament. And so we can learn the way that the Holy Spirit has ordered the church for people to learn. But there's another reason for going to group Bible studies, and it's not an obvious one. But by us turning up to Bible studies, we make it conducive for other people to be there. You know, and, and that's quite an important point. Um, sometimes you might be in a situation where you feel, you know, I don't get a lot out of this particular Bible study. There, there was a church I used to go to where every week I found it really hard to follow the teacher. Um, I found a teaching style hard to grasp from my own personal uh, uh, learning style. And, but I made a decision. I said, you know, what, I'm going to turn up because by me being there, I might be able to bless other people. And as you all know, if none of you turned up today and I was here teaching from the Bible, if someone walked in, they probably think, I feel a bit uncomfortable being here with this guy with a microphone around his head and the speakers and there's no one sitting here. So when we turn up to activities, we're actually making it conducive for other people to be there. So last Friday night at Gospel Night, it was great. We had a whole bunch of people come in and it meant for the young people there, they're seeing, oh yeah, there's a whole family here of Christians following God and it made it, a conducive, made it conducive for them to be there. So that's important. There's also, these days, MP3 studies. Go on the internet, download MP3s with good Bible teachers. Biblicaltraining.org is the best website I've found for MP3 teaching if you're into the internet. Biblicaltraining.org. Amazing teaching on there. You've got DVD studies. We do DVDs. A lot of our sermons are up on the internet now, um, which is pretty cool. And there's other guys who do DVDs. Not too many at the moment, but it's happening. So it's getting easier and easier to study the Bible. For people who are TV junkies, now they can just get a DVD and watch it. And obviously there's teaching others as well, which, like I said, is a gift. And if anyone feels that they want to do that, then come and see me and talk to me. But do talk to me, because it is a gift with serious consequences. And that's a whole other Bible study we won't go into today. But, so that's teaching... Now let's check the next one. Preaching. Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom as he's going around. All the areas he's going to, he's preaching the good news of the kingdom. And it's good news because he's preaching that, yeah, the devil had come to the earth and set up his kingdom. It says that in the Bible, that the devil's got his kingdom. The devil is the prince, right? And so you've got the devil reigning in the earth. Then Jesus comes 2,000 years ago and he sets up his kingdom. And he's like, now it's time for my kingdom. And so this is the good news. It's like, we don't have to live in Satan's kingdom anymore. We can live in Jesus' kingdom. And that kingdom, since it turned up, has been growing bigger and bigger, just like a seed that's small, but then turns into a mustard seed. Uh, <laughs> got that wrong. Turns into a big tree. There you go. Not a, <laughs> a seed that turns into a big tree. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Right. So this is good news. But also, it's news that needs to be announced to people. Like I was sharing earlier, when I had met up with some people, they had no idea about this good news. A lot of people don't. So that's why Jesus went around announcing it to people. You know, hey, this is good news. You need to know about this. And check this out, right? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. We're going to be darting in and out of Acts, because Acts is a really good way of seeing if what I'm teaching <laughs> is le a legit application for us today. Because if Jesus taught it, and then you see it lived out in Acts, and especially then if you see it taught in the epistles, you're like, okay, it's pretty safe to go with this line of thought. So Acts 1, verse 6. These are the disciples, right? When they are gathered together, they began to ask him, Lord, is this the time when you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? That's how we feel a lot like. 
You know, is it time? Is, it, is Jesus going to come back? Verse 7, he told them, You are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the farthest parts of the earth. So what Jesus is saying to them, hey, right now, your job is to be my witnesses. That's going to happen before the kingdom comes. And we know from what else it teaches in Scripture that we all have a duty as witnesses. I'm not saying we're all Billy Graham evangelist types who will stand up in football stadiums with loudspeaker system and preach to millions of people. But we're all people who can be witnesses that just represent Jesus and tell people we know Jesus is real. This is what he's done for me. He could do this for you. Um, and here's some applications. In your work breaks, you can tell people about Jesus. And I wrote work break because if your boss has paid you to do a particular job and you don't do that but just preach to people, you could argue you're being dishonest to your boss. If you can preach whilst you're doing the job, then that's wonderful. But let's not get a bad reputation of being Christians that don't do our jobs. So work breaks, let's tell our colleagues, let's tell our friends. There's outreaches, you know, we can be at outreaches and again, even if you don't think you've got a major part to play in the outreach, by being a member of the crowd or being a member of the crew or whatever, you are making it a conducive environment for other people to come and be part of that. So it really makes a difference when you're doing outreaches. I mean, I did an outreach up north a while back and it was really, it was hard work because there was hardly any of us and I'm there on a microphone on my own. And it was hard work and it was like, boy, it'd be sure nice if some more people turned up from the church just then we've got a whole family here and it, it's just better there's also bible distribution that's what you know we've got this little sticker machine that we got for free so now we can get you know bibles and put stickers with the church info on contact details and just hand them out in Wandsworth real easy thing everyone can do maybe I'll train Jade, Jada up that she can start doing that soon you know that might be quite effective she goes up to some hardened thug with a little bible <laughs> Um, and then we've got Gospel Night, which you all know about, obviously. I had to put a plug in for that. You know, you can all come and be part of that. Or help other ways, babysitting whilst we're at Gospel Night, all kinds of stuff. Um, making activities conducive for others to be there. Now, let's look at the third thing Jesus did. Anyone remember what it is? Healing. healing. Yeah, healing. Right, so... We know Jesus healed people who were in physical pain. And we know we can pray for people to be healed of physical sickness. Um, I also believe that healing doesn't necessarily have to be physical. But there's also a lot of emotional problems people have. There's also a lot of financial problems people have. There's all kinds of problems. And I think it would be fair to say that as a church, we need to be involved in healing in all those areas. I think that's safe to say. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 44, Acts chapter 2, verse 44, this is a description of the early church, right? It says, All who believed were together and held everything in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and not disputing, and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Now that sounds like a therapeutic environment to me. That sounds like an environment where if you were there, you would get so much healing in your life. If you had chips on your shoulder about the way family had treated you or friends had treated you, by being in this environment, you would be like, oh, you know, all that stuff would just fade away as you start experiencing what's called the body of Christ, which is the church. So I think it's important for us to realize that the early church in the book of Acts wasn't just a preaching and teaching church, but it was a church where it appears there would have been very much a lot of healing going on. You know, there was socializing going on. There was sharing of food. There was, oh, what, you're in trouble. I'm going to sell my house. And then we <laughs> divvy up the money. That's kind of crazy, you know. 
people are probably going to come up to me afterwards and tell me to sell my house now. Now this, this isn't prescriptive, this passage here. It's not saying this is what everyone has to do, but this is an example of when these guys became believers, the fruit of what happened. And there might be different implications for each one of us. And uh, I believe that's something the Holy Spirit would speak to us all about individually. Now, the application is not for us to all be like, yeah, that's right, where's my healing then? I know it's easy for us to think that way. Like, yeah, come on then, where's my healing? I want to get healed. You lot got to heal me. It's a two-way thing. It's where we've all got to say, okay, how can I play my part in making the church a healing environment? It's a two-way thing. If we all do that, we will have a therapeutic environment here where people will be healed. But if we all start thinking, yeah, but what about me? What am I getting? How am I going to get healed by you lot? If we do that, we're just going to end up being selfish individuals that will never work together. It's a bit like when someone wants to get married, you often hear people say, I'm looking for Mr. Wright, or I'm looking for Mrs. Wright. He was actually a caretaker at my school, Mr. Wright. But after a while, I realized that they didn't all want to marry him. Now, what someone said to me once was, it's not about finding the right person, it's about being the right person. So instead of saying, I'm looking for Mr. Wright, or Mrs. Wright, we should say, I'm going to try and be Mr. Wright. And then, by me focusing on that, when the right person does turn up, I'm the right person. I can bring good stuff into the relationship. And I think a similar thing can happen with the church, where instead of us thinking, how can this church help me? Which is what, come on, we're all going to think that. We're all going to, I, I think that. I'm the pastor, <laughs> you know. And there's times I'm tired and I think, oh, I need help. But what we should all be thinking is, how can I help my brothers and sisters in the church? And as a result of us all doing that, we're going to end up loving one another and then we're going to be getting that help, but it will be given to us freely rather than us demanding it. So specifically, applications, we could be praying for people to be healed, praying for people's needs. That's why we started up the prayer book that's going around so we know what one another's needs are. And personally, I find that very helpful. Once I've read that book, then for the rest of the week, I know what everyone's needs are. I can be praying for that. And God answers prayers. Then there's just being friends. Being friends is important. Uh, phoning people up. Visiting people. Sharing things with people. Uh, talking to people. Greeting strangers. You know, people that come into our church, greeting them, making them feel welcome. And turning up to events. Uh, again, that whole thing of the more of us at different activities we run, the more comfortable people will feel when they come in. So those are just some applications. There's probably many more. Um, but before we move on to the next verse, something really important, right? This teaching, preaching, and healing thing, we've got to get a balance of all three things because when you're making an application from a text in the Bible, it's not a proper application if you don't take into consideration all the key elements in that verse. Uh, remember that for when you're doing your own personal Bible study. What you need to do, you look at a verse and you say, what are all the key elements here? And whatever application you make, if it doesn't involve every single one of those key elements, then it, well, sometimes you can get away with missing one out, depending on what it is. But if you miss out more than one, you know it's not a proper application. So... Now I've told you that, I know you're going to be watching my sermons much more closely. I'm sure that I've done plenty of applications where I haven't done it right this way. So, the point is, as a church, if we just say now, yeah, we need to be a teaching church, it's not a proper application. If we say we need to be preaching church, doing outreaches all the time, not a proper application. What we need to say is, as a church, we need to be teaching, preaching, and healing. We need to have a good balance of all of these things. So, let's move on to the next verse. Matthew 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were bewildered and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, we've got this word here, compassion. And the Greek word here for compassion is used in the Gospels for Jesus every time it leads to action. You don't see this word used 
without action, okay? So the point is that compassion leads to action, okay? It is, it is a word that conveys deep emotion inside. It does mean inside Jesus was like, oh, I've got compassion. But it also means he then would act on it. So that's quite important there. It shows us that having compassion isn't about going, ah, oh, or just being sad about something. It means actually acting afterwards. So if we want to mirror Jesus, then we want to have compassion for the lost, but we also want to act on that. And it, this situation needed action because it says here that they were bewildered and helpless. Now, I'd actually translate that as troubled and helpless that they were troubled and helpless and in fact the word there for helpless is a word that literally means thrown down on the ground so like sheep that have been attacked by wolves and are lying down on the ground now helpless they weren't able to help themselves and they're wounded now so this leads to an important point that the lost are not able to help themselves the lost, unbelievers, people who don't know Jesus, are not able to help themselves. Now, I know that might seem simple, but I think there is so much in that statement there. Because sometimes we take the attitude, as Christians, that the lost just need to sort themselves out. I know sometimes I feel that way. Ah, oh, they, they need to sort themselves out. They need to repent. And sometimes we forget ourselves and our own conversions to Christ. And sometimes we view ourselves in a better light than we ever really were. And we think, well, I repented. They need to repent. <laughs> and sometimes we forget that there were other people involved in our lives for us to repent. And a huge amount of grace from God. So, when we start thinking, ah, oh, we got saved because we were good. The lost aren't good. They need to fix up. We need to realize we're starting to think a bit like Pharisees there and realize, no, we weren't saved because we were good. That's the wrong thinking. People who are lost cannot help themselves. They need help. But what kind of help? Well, we'll come to that later. But before we do, just remember that none of you were saved because you were good. I wasn't saved because I was good. We all need help. So, in the next verse it says, sorry, in the same verse it says, they were troubled and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. Now this is a phrase that you find in the Old Testament in reference to a lack of leadership. In Numbers 27, what we was reading a few weeks ago, verse 15, Moses is talking to God, right? And it says, Then Moses spoke to the Lord, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all mankind, appoint a man over the community. Because Moses knows his time is going to end. There needs to be someone else to lead after him. Yeah? Verse 17, who will go out before them and who will come in before them and who will lead them out and who will bring them in so that the community of the Lord may not be like sheep that have no shepherd. So Moses was like, look, I'm leading all these people, all of God's people, the Israelites. But when I die, if there isn't a leader, there'd be like sheep without a shepherd. And then you've got Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 2. Son of man, this is what God says to Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. In other words, the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders. A long, long time ago, he's saying, prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not shepherds feed the flock so here you've got God saying a message for the religious leaders of that day saying you've been feeding yourselves but you haven't been feeding my people so here we've got another picture of sheep without a shepherd question based on what we've already done today and what Jesus did how should shepherds feed the flock teaching Preaching and healing. There you go. Teaching, preaching, and healing. And we see that in verse 3 of Ezekiel 34. He says, But you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, 
brought back the strays or sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled over them. Now if we had time, we break down this verse and look how in there you can actually see teaching, preaching and healing. It's, it's, it's quite deep. So these are things that God wants to happen with his people. And these are things that we, the church, should be doing. And you might think, well, hang on a minute. Isn't this talking about Israel, the sheep of Israel, the flock of Israel? And you are right, it is. But check it out, yeah? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 16, I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. He's talking to Jews at the time. So he's saying, yeah, there's a Jewish sheepfold. I've got some other sheep over there. That's us, non-Jewish people, Gentiles. And he says, I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's good news for us lot, I tell you. We aren't Jewish. So he's saying there's going to be one flock. So when we hear Jesus talking about shepherd and sheep, we don't have to think, oh, that don't include me, that's just the Jews. It's like, no, nah, there's going to be one flock from Jesus' own lips, he said that. So the point is that people need a shepherd. People need a shepherd. We don't need the council to be better. We, you know, we think that it would be nice. You know, we don't need the mayor of London to have better ideas. That would be nice. But what we all need is a shepherd. We all need that big time. And who's the shepherd? Jesus. That's right. And Jesus also gives a lesser job to people, his followers, to be shepherds as well. Um, This is how it works. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 5, starting at verse 1, Peter says, I urge the elders among you, and they would be the leaders in the church, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. Then when the chief shepherd appears, who's the chief shepherd? Jesus. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So this shows us how we operate as a church. You've got the chief shepherd, Jesus. Okay, it's not me, right? <laughs> and it's not Chuck Smith, right? It's Jesus. He's the chief shepherd, right? Then you've got other people who are shepherds, not like the chief shepherd, but shepherds who are being examples to the flock and helping the flock to have that relationship with the chief shepherd. So that, that is like part of my job is is not to lord authority over people in the church, but to be helping people come under that leadership of the chief shepherd. And and then it says about people having humility with one another. So it's not the idea that in the church we're all like, well, who's more important than who? It's like we're all focusing on the chief shepherd, and different ones of us have got a role to help one another focus on the chief chief shepherd. Getting tongue-tied here. So if we have more time, we'd look at this more. For you ladies... This is the book you're looking at in the women's Bible study, so you'll have a lot of fun with this bit. Now, back in the Gospel of Matthew, right, Jesus is looking at the people and he's seeing they don't have good leadership and he's got compassion from it. There isn't good leadership that's pointing them to Jesus. They've got leadership, they've got all these Pharisees, but they don't have people pointing them to Jesus. So he has compassion. And what does compassion lead to? Action, yeah. That word for compassion in the Gospels always leads to action. And this is that this is the action. Let's look at what it is. Matthew nine Matthew nine thirty seven. Did I just come out of the speakers there? I've just have I come back? No. Have I come back now? Okay, sorry about that. I haven't quite worked out this remote control yet. Verse 37, this is the action that comes from Jesus' compassion. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Did you notice his attitude toward the lost there? He sees unbelievers as potential believers unbelievers as potential believers now harvest in the bible can sometimes refer to judgment 
but it can also refer to people being brought into God's kingdom. And in this instance, this is what Jesus is talking about. Sees all the people, and he's not thinking, ah, they're all going to get judged. He's thinking, boy, there's a lot of people here that can come into the kingdom. That's the way he views it. So it's important that we mirror this attitude. You know, I, when I was looking at this text, I was like, wow, I really need to start viewing the harvest field this way. You know, apparently a guy called Barclay reckons that the Pharisees in those times viewed common people as people just ready to be judged. <laughs> so a lot of the Pharisees, if he's right, would have been walking around seeing people and being like, ah, they're going to get judged one day. They're going to get burned up or whatever they was thinking. You know, and sometimes as Christians, we slip and we get this same mentality and we can think, oh, sinners, especially if you had a bad day, <laughs> you know. It's a bad day in Wandsworth, and at the end of it, you're just like, sinners, God's going to come and judge one day. But really, we should be mirroring Jesus' attitude and being like, oh, a whole bunch of people that can come into the family. And if we think that way, our lives will be revolutionized. We won't be so bitter, so fed up. We'd just be thinking, oh, boy, that brother there is a guy who can get saved. Yes, he cut me up, or he did this, or he did that, but he could be my brother. He could get saved. I was with Shay the other day, going somewhere, didn't really want to go too tough. And I said to her, I said, look, there's a whole bunch of people who could be saved by the end of the evening. You know, so that was the attitude we had when we went. And it was good. It was good. So let's view unbelievers as potential believers and talk to them with love and patience. Uh, remember, they're not able to help themselves. Like a the sheep can't help themselves. They need a shepherd and they need people to lead them to that shepherd. That's our job. Now, after Jesus had been resurrected, check out what the disciples said to him. Acts 1 verse 6. I, I know I said this to you before, but we're going to read it out again. So when they gathered together, they began to ask him, Lord, is this the time when you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? He told them, you are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now sometimes we're thinking, God, when are you going to set up your kingdom proper? Just like the disciples were. And Jesus is like, no, wait a minute. You're going to be my witnesses now because I want a whole lot more people getting saved coming into the harvest. Now don't be selfish. I know you want it to end now. <laughs> You're in the fold, but we need more people coming in. So now I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so you can be witnesses. The Holy Spirit isn't just so we can feel great. It's so that we can go out there and be witnesses to other people. So, this verse, verse 37. Sorry, verse 38. He says, Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Sorry, I should have read out verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. This is shocking. We thought the problem was everyone's terrible sinners. And we get up on our high horse and be like, ah, oh, they're sinners. And we think that's the problem. But here, Jesus is saying the problem is there aren't enough workers. That's deep. That's really deep. We thought the solution was to pray that everyone becomes Christians. Jesus is saying... Pray that workers are sent out. You see how often we end up thinking the wrong way, not realizing how Jesus is viewing the harvest. So the problem is not enough workers. That's the problem. That's the problem. Not enough workers. And the solution is pray for more workers to be sent out. Pray for more workers to send out. Send out. Jesus has chosen us to do the harvest. For some reason. <laughs> I don't understand it, but he's chosen us to do it. He's gone up to heaven, and now we continue the same ministry that he started. And the hindrance to that ministry is not the lost. The hindrance is not enough workers sent out into the harvest. So this leads to an important question for us. That are we being faithful workers ourselves? If we've been sent out. Are we being faithful with that? So the question is, Am I playing my part in the church's ministry of teaching 
preaching and healing. And remember, I was saying there's a balance of those three things. Like, I don't want to be saying, okay, I'm doing the teaching. I don't need to be involved in outreach. <laughs> and I, I don't want to say, well, I'm doing the teaching and the preaching. Now I don't have to be involved in healing. You know, so we've got to get this balance of these things. And it also leads to this question. Do I pray that the lost will get magically saved? You know, because... I suddenly realized as I was looking at this, I was like, at prayer meetings, we always pray people will get saved. I'm not going to say that's wrong. I think prayer is talking to God, so you can ask him all kinds of things. But I can't find an example in the New Testament where this happened. Now, I could be wrong. If you find an example, let me know. But what I keep seeing is examples of praying for the workers. Paul says, pray that I will have boldness for the gospel. Like, uh, I can't see examples of people saying, God, let that person magically get saved. It seems that God's interested in us going and, and doing the work. And we pray that we would be empowered to do that. Um, so that, that's just interesting. Maybe sometimes we kind of hide away from doing the work. We pray that the work will be done. <laughs> but we don't do it ourselves. Or we don't pray other people will be sent out to do it. Um, here's an example of a prayer meeting from Acts. Just so you know, I'm not making it up. Um, but check me, you know, look, look in the Bible and look for examples. If you do find an example, let me know quick. <laughs> we'll edit this bit out of the DVD. Acts 4.29. This is a prayer meeting. And now, Lord, pay attention to their threats and grant to your servants to speak your message with great courage. So that's what they, they pray that they would get great courage. While you extend your hand to heal. So they're praying that healings will be taking place. And to bring about miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of the Lord courageously. So they came out of the prayer meeting speaking the word of God courageously. Sometimes we come out of prayer meetings thinking, good, I prayed that people will get saved. Now I can chill out. These guys were praying, God, equip us to do your work. And then they got equipped and they went out and did it. So looking at this has really changed my attitude a lot about prayer, prayer for the lost. It's something we're going to have to look at a lot more in depth at a later date. Um, so the application is be a worker for all of us. Let's be workers, workers in the harvest. Let's turn up at outreaches and stuff, even if we're shy. You know, just by being there, we can make a difference. Also, let's pray for new workers. Pray for new workers to be sent out. It might be believers who just haven't yet felt a call to be involved in the work. Or it might just be people that, who knows, I don't know. People from other areas coming to move here to Wandsworth, I don't know. But let's pray for God to send out new workers. And let's also pray for existing workers. Pray that we would get boldness to preach. Pray for brothers and sisters of ours that they would get boldness to preach. You know, pray for Ephraim this week. He's in South Africa. You know, pray for him that God will give him boldness and speak for him. You know? So, to sum everything up. As a team, as a church, we've got to strike this balance of teaching, preaching, and healing. We've got to get this balance. I think for us as a church, we're weak and healing. I really do. And I don't just mean physical healings. I mean as a group, being in an environment where people just are like, wow, there's so much love here. I think this is something we can all work on. We need compassion. Compassion for the lost. And uh, in that compassion, we should see unbelievers as what? Potential... Believers, yeah, potential believers. Let's not be hating people who aren't believers thinking, oh, sinners. Let's think, now these are people Jesus wants to bring into our family. And compassion leads to what? Action. action, yeah. Compassion leads to action. And part of that action is to pray for workers. Let's pray for workers, new workers and existing workers. Let's pray for ourselves that God would equip us to be workers because we can't do it in our own strength. This, I think, is a good example of like a job description for the church. 
what we should be doing as a church. There's a lot of things there to pray about, meditate, check with scripture when you get home, and just ask God, God, what do you want to say to me about my role in the church or our role as a church? We're a new church. It seems like hard work, a church plant. But the reality is, I was thinking about this, a church plant shouldn't be harder work than a well-established church. All that happens is in a well-established church, there's more opportunity to hide and then draw back from things. But the reality is, I know it's hard work, guys, what we do here, but the reality is, even when there's a hundred of us in the future, we should still be working hard, being workers for God. And, and I really think that's how God wants us to operate, as workers in the field, not like some of us are like, well, boy, everyone else goes out of the field at 7 o'clock, but I'm going to turn up at 11. You know, like the way management do when they turn up in the office late, that kind of thing. I think it's really like, no, we're all doing hard graft for God together. And it's tiring. But that's not because we're a church plant. That's because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So be encouraged. If you're tired and thinking, but this is tough. You know, it's like, well, praise God, man. You're really working for God. You're getting tired for God. That's a good thing. We want to be workers that come off the harvest field sweating and smelly. <laughs> Go and take our shower in heaven. All right, I'm going to pray. Jesus, I thank you that for some crazy reason you choose to use us in your harvest field. And I pray that you'd help us all to be workers in your field. I pray that you'd fill us up with your Holy Spirit and equip us to work. Help us, God, to be teaching and preaching but help us as well to be a healing environment, please, God. Help us to have love for one another. Help us to have patience with one another. Help us to have the right attitude to people, Lord God. Pray that you'd help us to follow you, God. Add to our number, Lord, and help us to be active in that. Speak to us and show us the things that we should be involved in. Help us be wise with our time, God. And uh, we just look forward to meeting you one day face to face when you come back and meeting all the people that you brought in the harvest. Amen.